Well, good morning. I get a kind of an early Christmas gift this morning because I get to sit back and listen as Larry Felder comes. He's going to share the word with us. And Larry has been a tremendous blessing. Uh, how many of you have enjoyed the, the new energy that Larry and Marissa have brought to our worship? And we are grateful for that. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says that God gives people as gifts. Not only are gifts things that we give, but God gives certain gifts to his church. And Larry has certainly been one of those gifts that God has given to us. Larry has a heart for worship and enthusiasm and energy. Uh, and a, a, a heart that wants to bring people into the presence of God. But Larry is also a very uh, good communicator. He is an excellent preacher. He knows the word. He's walked with God for a long time. And uh, you're in for a treat. So as I often say when Larry comes, buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> and uh, Larry, would you come and join us? Uh. Thank you, sir. I love you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, one of these peace messages, Christmas time, right? Uh, I can tell you that we are going to talk about peace, but you do need to buckle your seatbelts because we're going to tap on some things that I think God wants you to know, and by virtue of that, we're all going to grow. How many want to grow? Good, good. Now, I can give you a message in time if you'd like. I can go back on the podium and we can give you a message in time. A nice Christmas message. We can bundle it up really nice. It'll be cool. And you will say, wow, we're in our hearts warm by the nice Christmas message and we're all at peace. But that won't change your life. I choose to give you a word in season. Something that I believe is coming directly from the heart of God to you and to me. I believe that when we hear God's heart, we change. See, it's one thing to tell someone, um, I love you, right? And, and they're not able to hear it because maybe they didn't hear us over the phone. Maybe their hearing aid is turned down. But when God says, I love you, and we hear him, it has the power to change our lives. So we're going to talk about something I'm entitled the unclaimed gift, all right? So just let's, uh, let's get busy and let's get into this a little bit. I'm going to open up this laptop. My man Ernie said, Larry, if you want, you can actually get into the, um, to the new thing, brother, and uh, I can let you borrow my iPad. But if you choose to just use that monstrosity called a laptop, you can do that. So, Ernie, I hear you, my brother. You were right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go here. And, and good. Very good. All right. Some years ago, my kids were really, really young. And... Um, for some reason or other, I was behind in my bills. Anybody ever been there? Okay, so just me. All right, I get it. And uh, I was behind in my mortgage. And um, I was understandably really, really stressed out about it. And so um, a dear sister in Christ, her name is Beverly Wilkerson, wonderful, wonderful senior anointing, senior Christian. I was talking with her, and um, she said, how you doing? I said, fine, blessed in Jesus' name. Yeah, okay. And then she looked me in the eyes and said, how you doing? I said, well, just going through some financial struggles right now and um, just working my way through it. And then she said, did something very, very strange. She looked me in the eyes and she said, you have the money. What in the, how does she know what I have in my bank account? So I accepted. I thought she was crazy. Went home. 
was looking through my files a few days later and discovered that I had several thousand dollars in an account that I actually had forgotten about that had gone unclaimed. All of the stress, all of the worry, all of the stuff that I was going through because I couldn't pay my mortgage, God had actually answered the problem before the problem and simply alerted me to the situation. So this unclaimed gift became clean. But I had to go through something in order to do that. You know what it was? I had to go through this open conversation with a sister and talk to her about something that I was going through. And by virtue of that, God dispatched a word to me that sent me doing something that I ordinarily would not have done. You know, this whole peace thing around Christmas time, you know, peace on earth, goodwill among men, God has sent peace, all of that great stuff. I think that it is an unclaimed gift. It is the unclaimed gift. You want to prove it? Ask yourself how comfortable you are right now during this season. Ask yourself if you're stress-free. Ask yourself if you're not worried. Ask yourself if you are at a state of peace right now. And I'd say to you, generally, you're like most of us who are going through all of the normal motions and you're not at peace. Let me tap you on the heart for a moment, Christian. Now, for a moment, I'm not talking about talking to those of you who don't know Jesus. <clears throat> but if you know Jesus as your personal Savior, this question is for you. Why don't you have peace? Christian, Bible toter, prayer, why are you stressed? I can understand why the world gets stressed, but why are you stressed? Let's examine some of that, okay? Let's look at Luke 2, verse 14. All right. All right. Glory to God in the highest. In honor is peace among those with whom he is pleased. All right. A little theological lesson here. Quickly, we tend to think, and we use this scripture around Christmas time, obviously, and we tend to think that this peace that these angels are talking to the shepherds about has to do with peace among men. That is not what this text is talking about. This text basically is saying this the peace that Jesus Christ represents and will bring to the earth 33 years later by virtue of his death, burial, and resurrection, is the satisfaction of my wrath, God speaking, of my wrath upon the sins of mankind. But it can only pass to those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So he is not saying peace among men, that we have peace with one another. This peace is not among men, it's coming from God to men. Get the difference? All right, look at Matthew 10, next verse there. Matthew 10, verse 34 says, Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. Verse 39, He that findeth his life shall lose it, but he that loses his life for my sake will find it. All right, so God is either schizophrenic or there's something here we need to explain. The angels come to God, come to the angels, I'm um, sorry, to the, to the shepherds in the field, and they tell them, peace to earth, right? And then Jesus is talking, and he says, I don't know what's going on with you guys, but I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. What on earth is he talking about? Well, when you look at the text, and you go back to the first verse, you find that Jesus has selected 12 disciples. Now, it took him a little time to do that. When you read the Gospels, it, it may appear as though Jesus did this in one night, he didn't. It took some time to choose these 12 men. He went through prayer. He talked to his father. His father led him. He chose these 12 men. So now he's sending these 12 men out, and he says, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and heal the sick, raise the dead, 
do all these incredible things. And by the way, as you travel, don't make reservations in a hotel, okay? I want you to stay with people, okay? And, and if they allow you to come into their house, then your peace remains there. If they don't, don't stay there, obviously. Shake the very dust off your feet. Keep moving. And then he says something really strange. It'll be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that house that did not receive you. So basically his point is this. The peace of the gospel comes when those who are accepting, accepting of Jesus Christ are receiving the gospel. In other words, if they're obedient. So it's sort of conditional. If you're obedient and you do it my way, then it's peace. Sort of like my son. Uh, my wife and I have two adult children. But when my son was probably around 16 years old, we were in the mall one day, and uh, Marissa and I were walking about three or four feet ahead of my son. And generally, we tried, to, we tried to buy our children name brand things and whatever, but there were times when we couldn't do it, and so we didn't. And so I remember being in the mall, I was walking, Marissa was walking with me, we were shopping, I guess it's around Christmas time or whatever, and he's about three or four feet behind me, sort of dragging his feet. And uh, he's arguing, for, making a, trying to make a case to get these name brand whatever. I don't know whether it was sneakers, shirt, whatever it was. And so I said, um, yeah, we'll try to get your name brand, but, um, you know, I may not be able to do that. So he pauses for a couple of seconds, and he says under his breath, as if I couldn't hear him, if you don't buy me name brand, I'm not going to wear them. So I stopped, waited for him to catch up, looked in his face, and said, everything you have on belongs to me. That was a little bit of an assault, but I'm just telling you what I said. Everything you have on belongs to me, and everything I buy you, you will wear. Do you understand that? Here was the point. There would be peace in my home if he does what I tell him to do. If he doesn't do what I tell him to do, there's no peace. In essence, that was what God was laying down. Jesus was saying, here's the gospel. You do it my way, there's peace. If you don't do it my way, you're going to have a problem. In fact, even in your own home, daughters will be at enmity or in disagreement with their moms, and, and sons will be in disagreement with their fathers, and fathers with sons, and husband and wife. In fact, in a man's home, there will be enemies. Because Jesus is really drawing a line in the sand, and he's saying the truth is this. Receive the truth, and you'll have peace. Buck against the truth, and in this world, you won't have peace. That's sort of the theological differences between the two verses. Let's keep moving on. Let's look at what peace is. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. The word peace there is our word Irene. Any Irenes in the house? Okay. Irene. What it means is, keep going. No, the other way. There you go. State of tranquility. No big deal there. You all knew that, right? You don't need me up here talking about what peace is because you know what that is. Next. Harmony between individuals. Getting a little closer now. Obviously, this peace that God was talking about, that the angels were talking to the shepherds about, has to do with that. Harmony between individuals. Harmony between God and man, right? Next one. The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation Clearly, that's Luke 2.14, right? Here's the one I love. Exemption from the rage and havoc of war. Apply this, Larry. Okay. We'd like to think that we're talking about terrorists versus non-terrorists and war on a, natural, on a national scale. But how many of you know that we have wars within us? The book of James, fourth chapter and the first verse, it says, how do these quarrels and arguments come up? Are they not the passions that are at war within you? Next slide, please. Okay. We live in a tension between the spirit man and our flesh. That's where you and I live. We are a spirit. We possess a soul. And they're both housed in a body. 
Okay? We are a spirit. We have a soul. And they're both housed inside of a body. Here's how it works. In 2 Corinthians 5, it talks about if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. What that means, Joe, is in your spirit man, if you're born again, he is perfect. There is no need to grow in, this, in that spiritual state, in that spiritual man. He is born again. Jesus Christ is there. No need. That it's, you're perfect there. In your body, however, our earth suits, we're able to communicate back and forth to one another because we see one another. We're using the faculties of the physical being to speak, to communicate, to dance, to play a little basketball, to sing, and whatever we do, we're doing that through our body. It's being communicated through our spirit, but in essence, we're able to communicate that in this realm because we have a body. If you don't believe that, try to take this body into space and see what happens. Yeah, see, this body adapts to this environment, right? Here's where the problem is. It's not in the spirit. It's not necessarily in the body. It's that in-between place called the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions. It's what Paul talked about in Romans 12. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might be able to determine or discern the perfect and acceptable will of God. Here is that in English. The only way you're really going to know what's going on in the earth realm and from God's standpoint is to have your mind changed. Your spirit is fine. That's wonderful. Praise God. Hallelujah. We get to heaven by virtue of the fact that we have been regenerated or regenerated. Our spirit man is no problem. Our body is what, our, what it is, you know, it's earthly expressions. Oh, but in the area of the soul, and here's where you need to keep your seatbelts fastened because we're going to go some places that might be a little painful for some of us, but I'm telling you it'll be worth it. Say that with me. It may be painful, but it's worth it. Okay. I love it when Christians talk about the joy of the Lord, and we talk about how we're saved, we're sanctified, we're full of God, and yet we got anger issues up the wazoo. We've got issues with lust. We've got issues with one another where we're uncomfortable around one another. How is that possible when you have the Spirit of God in you, and I have the Spirit of God in me, and you have the Spirit of God in you, yet we can't get along? It's not the Spirit. It's the soul. It's our mind. It's our will. It's our emotions that are created. You ready for this? That are created by our everyday experiences through your family of origin. If I asked you how you handle money, if you've not been converted, I bet you handle money the way your parents handled money. If I asked you how you handle your relationships, you would say, well, this is what I do. If we search your family of origin, you might say, wow, that's how my father dealt with my mom. If I asked you other questions relative to relationships, you would begin to put two and two together and say, holy cow. I'm actually living out a script unbeknownst to me. How do we change it? What do we do? You know what, let's dig in a little deeper there. Let's dig in a little deeper. Um, some years ago, my wife and I were seeing a counselor and... Uh, a lot of really cool things came out of those sessions, but no more cooler than this. Um, I realized through my counselor that I had issues with strong, positive, extroverted women. 
I had an issue with that. But I didn't know. And here's how we discovered it. We started looking at the family of origin and seeing what mom was like, what dad was like, and all of our experiences and so on and so forth. And then a friend of mine, a friend of ours, came in from California. So she came over to visit, and this was during the summertime. Now, I had already told my wife two weeks before this, we are not replacing the air conditioner in the living room. Okay? We're not doing it. Budget's not there, yada, yada, yada. I know, it's kind of like a Scrooge, but that's what it was. You know, I said, nah, we're not doing anything. Right. But then our friend comes in from California. She sits down on the couch, and she says, boy, it's hot in here. I said, yeah, you're right. Let's go down to the store, Marissa, and buy a new air conditioner. My wife looked at me like I was crazy when our next session came up. She brought that up to the counselor. And I was like, well, what's the big deal? I was just trying to be a good guy. And my counselor looked me in the eye and he said, Larry, now who are you really trying to please? And it hit me. It was my mother. It was my mother that I was trying to please because that friend represented the same personality type as my mom. But now it's in a conscious realm so I can deal with it. That's what Paul's talking about when he says, be transformed by the renewing of the mind. In other words, don't live according to the way you've been raised per se. Don't live according to the things that are in your soul, that have been imprinted on your soul, that you have no idea about. And the only way you will know is by paying attention to the prompts. And we're going to tell you what the prompts are in a moment. That came to the conscious realm, never had that issue again. Went away. Because I was conscious of it. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. All right, great words, Paul. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many of you know Paul wasn't speaking English? All right, we read it in English, but that wasn't, it wasn't originally written in English, right? The Bible was originally written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, right? And generally, most of the New Testament is Greek. Well, the Greek word there for being transformed is our word metamorphosis. A caterpillar becomes a butterfly. In essence, what happens is it was one thing and has completely changed and been conformed to something else. By application, our mindset was one thing and it, completely, it should completely change to something else, i.e., to think like Christ, right? But then he says this word. He says, and be renewed. That Greek word there for renew is the word renovation. Anybody ever done any renovation work at a house or a building or whatever? Um, we had a fire last December 4th. Just moved back into the house this last past June. Um, we renovated that entire house. I mean, we ripped stuff out. We ripped down walls. We re-insulated the walls and everything. And I'm telling you, here's the interesting thing. We did not do anything to the foundation, your spirit man. But everything other than the foundation was ripped out and changed and made stronger. The way we reason, the spirit of God is saying, if it's not consistent with my word, I want it changed. The way we come to conclusions if it's not consistent with the book, I want it to change. The way we see people, if it's not consistent with the book, I want it to change. The way we interact with our significant others, if it's not consistent with the book, I want it changed. The way you see Christianity, if it's not consistent with the book, it needs to change. The way you see the world, the way you see sinners, the way you see God, what is it based on? What someone told you or what Jesus said? Let me push another button. Let me push another button. Do you know 
that racism is based on how we are raised? Let me say that again. Racism is based on how we were raised, steeped in fear. The way you see money, the way you view it, the way you understand it, is based on how you were raised. For instance, for instance, how many Christians do you know that actually think that poverty and spirituality are an equation? The poorer you are, the more spiritual you are. Wait a minute. That is not consistent with the book. Not if you read people like Job or Abraham or others. These men were rich. So is it a sin to be rich? Or does money take on the character of its possessor? And if the heart is right, then the money's going to be right. But the way we see it, perhaps, is the way we've been raised in the faith. How about the way we see women, men, in the church? Okay, I'm going to use the S word, sisters, okay? I got to use it, okay? Uh, Wives. Submit yourself (laughs) to your own husbands. I venture to say most women in church are afraid of that, not because of what God said, but because of how they see it lived out and expressed through our husbands, friends, fathers, other marriages, other situations. But Jesus says, when you listen to him, he says, well, really, we should be submitted to one another. Then he says to the husbands, love your wives like Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. Now, when I get to the place where I can love my wife sacrificially, maybe she'll get to the place where she can just submit. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> that, was, that was said poorly because it gives the impression that she's not submitted. That was, that was horrible. Wipe that from the tape. Wipe that from the tape. Yeah, you rewind. <laughs> She's a wonderful woman. But how many of you know we are living between the tension between who we are in Christ, really, we really are in Christ, and how we express ourselves? I call it the 90-10 rule, the iceberg rule. I say that the 10% visible that we see is what you and I want us to see. I'm going to show you 10% of who I am. But the 90% invisible... The stuff that's deeply seated in our soul area? Ooh, Jesus. If you could see what was down there. And that's the stuff that Jesus wants to get at. That was the whole point when he said, submitting yourself to me, giving yourself to me. Now, when you look at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? He talked about, uh, you know, turning the other cheek right? He talked about going two miles if someone asks you to go one. He says if someone asks you for your jacket, give them your cloak also. We like to look at that as specifics, but it really, there's a principle there. What do you suppose the principle there? When Jesus says when someone slaps you on one side, turn the other cheek, what do you think the principle is? It's getting beat up? I don't think so. It's not striving. It's not striving. Don't strive. Don't fight. Live in a place of peace. How do you do that, Larry, when you're in a world with people who your peace is their dis-ease and their, their peace, their comfortability is your dis-ease? I think you have to approach the scriptures and approach peace from an internal standpoint, and that's what I'm talking about today. Here's what Jesus said, or here's what Paul said in Philippians 4. He says, do not be full of care about anything, but by all things, by prayer and supplications, make your requests known unto God. And the God of peace will keep and guard your hearts and your minds 
through Christ Jesus. How do we get to a place of peace when we're these Christians and we're living in this world? Is it indeed possible during this season and others to live and have a life of peace? When your wife is sick or your husband is ill or your parents are ill, when this is going on and you've got enough money, too much month at the end of the money and all the, how do you live in a place of peace? I think that that text actually gives us some clues. So my final 10 minutes, I'm going to put my finger on some things. And maybe some, sometime in the future we'll do a three or four week course on this because there's a lot here. And all I'm doing is just hitting uh, bullet points really here. But here's what I want you to think about. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, 10th chapter, 9th verse, 9th and 10th, he says that if thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He said, because with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, but with the tongue, confession is made unto salvation. Let's think about that. Confess the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For or because with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Do you see the progression here? Believing unto righteousness, confessing unto salvation. Believing unto righteousness, confessing unto salvation. It's one thing to believe, but through our confessions, we actually live them out. What confession? James 5, 13 through 16. If we confess our faults one to another, we will be healed. All right, that's enough preaching. Let's apply. So you got issues with fear. You got issues with lust. You got issues with all sorts of in stuff. You got issues with people that aren't, that don't have themselves together. And you got to fix them. You're not necessarily, you think you're doing it because you love God. But in essence, you're really fixing them out of a place in your soul that's broken because you can't deal with their brokenness. So you got to fix them. How do you know that? I know that. We can do good things for the wrong reasons because they're coming out of a place in our soul that has become fractured. So here's the answer. Here's what we do. We take our fractured soul to Jesus. We take our fractured being to Jesus. And instead of praying like this, Lord, I thank you that uh, I'm not like so-and-so. You know, I got my issues, but thank you, God, that you saved me, and, and, and thank you, Jesus. Amen. How about a prayer like this? Um, Lord, I'm, uh, I'm working here, and sales are not growing like I'd like them to. And somehow I feel that maybe I'm not working as hard as I could. Maybe I'm not doing something correctly. Or I'm doing everything I know to do, but I don't know what else to do unless you help me. Father, I notice that whenever I'm around people that are in authoritative positions, I find that I cower. Why is that, Lord? Or I find that when I'm around extroverts, I find that I've got to be more extrovertive, if that makes any sense. Or I find that the simplest little things tick me off and get me really, really angry. I find that I can't handle anything. I'm always under stress, and I'm a Christian, and I don't know why that is. Here's what you will hear the Holy Spirit telling you. 
Here are some examples. Um, talk to so-and-so. Call so-and-so. You'll get a phone call out of the blue. You'll come to church and you'll hear something that you'll know is for you because you've been praying about these things. And you begin to hear things that are directly connected to your situation. And you hear the Holy Spirit saying, walk down that path. Walk down that path. And here's the thing. It's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done. Because how many of you know, I may be dysfunctional, but I know this dysfunction and it belongs to me. And even though I'm a Christian, praise the Lord, when I come into church, you're going to see the 10% visible. How you doing? Blessed. How you doing? I'm fine. Praise God. But the 90%, I believe that the Holy Spirit weeps for us. For he is saying, I've got an unclaimed gift for you, and it's the gift of peace. And you can have it if you surrender yourself to me. You will find, you will find that the more I give to him, the more you give to Jesus, the more he will begin to take off the layers as if it were an onion, and he will begin to peel things off that have held you captive and bond and bound for many, many years. Now, I believe, and I said this earlier, that Christianity has evolved or is evolving. I believe that. I believe that if we go out 250 years from now and we look back on Christianity and we put it under a microscope, we'll say, holy cow, it really did change over the last 100, 200 years. If you grew up in a church like I grew up in when I was a kid, um, most of you would be considered ungodly. Well, you don't have your heads covered, women. It's always about the women, never about the men. You know that? It's always about the women, right? You don't have your heads covered, so now you're in sin because you're not honoring your husbands. Okay? And you're wearing pants. Oh, God. Forty years ago, that was the norm, folks. It isn't today because we understand that our exegy of Deuteronomy 22 and 5 was wrong. A woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man, neither shall a man wear a woman's garment. I was, when I was eight years old, I was scratching my head saying, but those are women's pants. Those are men's pants. Shut up, boy. You don't know what you're doing. Okay. But 40 some odd years later, we see that, yeah, that was kind of ridiculous. That's kind of crazy. So Christianity is evolving. What else is evolving? The way we see mental illness. 40 years ago, everything was a demon. Everything was a demon. If you had an issue, I remember we were in Canada one time. Uh, We were ministering up in Canada, and we were thrust into this service, and we arrived there kind of late with our team, and there there was this girl, she was was balled up on the floor, and she was going through, yeah, you know, going through that kind of thing. And they said, Larry, Larry, lay hands on her, cast the demon out. Thank God. I I mean, I just stood back and said, okay, Lord, what's happening here? And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, it's not a demon, Larry. She's having an epileptic fit. So I told the people who were in charge, call the ambulance. She's having a fit. And then someone says, oh, yeah, that's right. She does have that. But Christianity is beginning to evolve because we're understanding everything's not a demon. Sometimes it's mental illness. Sometimes it's emotional strain and pain and the way we've been raised. And we have mama issues and daddy issues and sibling issues, which is why we can't get along as brothers and sisters in the church because we didn't get along with our brothers and sisters at home. And God knows that. And what he's saying is, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I can renew your mind. And here's how you do it. You bring everything to me, and I'll begin to deal with it. Take it all to me. Bring it all, lock, stock, and barrel. And I will begin to deal with it. And here's what you'll begin to notice almost immediately. Your countenance, your face will begin to change. Those knots in your stomach that you're feeling right now because I'm tapping on some things that you know are there. That uncomfortableness, you'll begin to feel that over time, God will begin to loosen the knots and you will begin to live in a place of freedom. 
that you've never ever experienced before. And so when Paul says that thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, he's actually quoting from Deuteronomy 30 where he says to Israel, those things that I've told you to do, they're not in the sea where you got to go over there and get them. They're not way up in the sky where you need to go up to the sky and get them. They're not in the mountain. I'm paraphrasing here. He said, but the word is, I love the language here, is nigh thee, even in your mouth. In English, what you want in me is in the power of your tongue. Say it, Lord, I am who you said I am. I will experientially be what you said I am. I will walk in a way that is pleasing to you, and I will not be led and driven by addictions because I belong to you, and you are cleaning out my soul. Oh, it's not my spirit. I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. But in my mind, will, and emotions, I cannot experience this peace of God that you talk about, Larry. Why? Because there's so much stuff there that God wants to begin to address. Amen? Amen. Read a quick story. Two men took their boats out to the sea to fish. After a very good catch, they rowed their two boats back toward the shore, only to discover that while they were fishing, the tide had gone out, leaving their cars quite a distance from the water. The first man decided to wait for the tide to turn and started cleaning his fish. However, the second man became very frustrated because he had many things to do and didn't have time to wait for the tide. So he jumped out of his boat and started dragging it over the long stretch of the beach. It was exhausting work. His boat was very heavy and laden with fish. But being a stubborn man, he was not easily deterred. It soon became clear he was getting nowhere fast, so he decided to lighten his load. He threw out his oars, lines, nets, and all the fish, then kept dragging. Step by agonizing step, he advanced. Every few meters, his, mo his boat excuse me, caught, was caught in the sand and wedged on a rock. In anger, he lifted it free, then heaved it further up the beach. Ever so slowly, he advanced closer to his car. Finally, with the last of his strength, he dragged his boat to the top of the beach. He laughed in exhilaration and shook his fist defiantly at heaven. And then to his complete surprise, he noticed the tide had come in behind him. <laughs> he watched speechless as the other man rowed his boat effortlessly to his car, placed his oars, nets, and clean fish into the back, then lifted his boat on top and drove away. The second man fell down exhausted. He did not have the strength to lift his boat. Every time you decide that your dysfunction is your own, you're carrying and dragging your boat. God has people in the body to help you. You're going through some stuff, that you say it's just between you and God and it's hidden? Trust me, folks, it's not really hidden. We may not see what it is, but we see you. And we see the stress on your face, so we know that there are things going on inside of you that need to be fixed, and you still want to drag your boat. Even through Christmas season, when we're hearing all about this peace and love and joy, I got good news for you. You don't have to drag the boat. God has people here in this ministry, there are elders here and others, who love you. I don't care what you have to confess. That's one thing about the Catholic Church I actually thought was pretty good. That whole confession thing, you know, there, now there are flaws with it, we know that. Don't, don't, don't go there, okay? We know that, <laughs> all right? But there is something about going to an individual and saying, look, I'm having a struggle with this. The worship team doesn't know this, but they'll know it now. Um, what we're going to start doing first of the year, we're going to begin to hold each other spiritually and morally accountable. 
There are going to be questions that we're going to have to ask each other every month. How you doing in this area? How you doing in that area? How you doing over here? How can we help you here? Why? Because I believe that the closer we live to who we are in Christ, the better we will minister. The more sensitive we will be to the Spirit of God. So I'm going to make a confession here today, December 18th, 2011. You ready? They're scared. (laughs) You see this? I'm going to work on this. I want you to talk to me April 18th, 2012. I owe you 15 pounds by then. There, I said it, so now I can't run away. Please hold me accountable. Because if you hold me accountable, I might just live longer. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask the worship team to come. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, this thing called peace, the Greek word irene or irene, is the absence of rage and inner wars. Lord, we are tired of battling with ourselves, fighting ourselves, and indeed fighting you. Be it this Christmas season, New Year, come spring, summer, fall, next year, we want to be closer to who you have called us to be. We want to be free. We want to be free. We are calling those things that are not a be not as though they were. So we, through confession, say that we are who you said we are. We are who you say we are. And we will begin to confess that not only in secret to you, but Lord, give us somebody in this life, in this, in this church or otherwise, that we can confess weaknesses to that will pray with us, give us sound advice, hold us accountable so that we might grow thereby. Today's message is simply about peace. But Lord, as you know, we don't need another message in time. We need to hear how we might grow in you. And so give us this irene, this peace that surpasses all human understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.